yeah, we did that. We got home. Um, the cat had a bit of a poop explosion in the oh, living right. room. As uh, right, as soon as I was like, oh yeah, give me a little more prep time, and then I spent the last half hour uh, bathing him because he got poop all over his fur and on the on his butt and stuff like that. And so I was just like, okay, okay, this is what I'm doing with my 30 minutes before we start. Not prepping jack shit. That's fantastic. And uh, yeah, so and then quickly assembling the setup, doing yeah. a five minutes of research on the wine. <laughs> Yeah, same buddy. Do, same. <laughs> that I'm gonna do today. I was like, oh, how does the time get away from me every time? Every I time. always carve out enough time for it. And then of course shit literally happens. And I uh, know yeah, I'm right there with you. It's been a hell of a week. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to yet another episode of the Wine and Comics Pairing Show. I'm Dave. I'm Dallas. And today we are going to pair another comic with another wine. This is going to be a basic everyday episode, if there is such a thing. Um, all right, we're going to kick it off this time around. Um, and fair warning, um, I'm going to pause because we might edit this out later. But fair warning, we are both entering this episode running on a little bit of fumes. So it, bear with us on this one. It might be a little hinky. Um, all right. Why don't, for the last time, I think I went first with my comic and wine. So let's do you first this time. All right, buddy. So, and I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm not pretty sure. I know you know this comic, this graphic. <laughs> I know for a fact you know this graphic. So uh, let me start by giving you some background info on the publisher. Publishers are Jesse Bausch and Patrick Godfrey, who created their imprint circa 2003. Uh, this graphic novel was eventually compiled by these two guys. Uh, as one of their inaugural releases. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, I think it was their second anthology. Oh, maybe. Okay, okay. Uh, published in 2004. Okay. So I got some ideas, got some ideas. All right. So a little bit about the actual comic itself. My notes here. Um, the oh, you have notes. You did prepare. I don't have notes. <laughs> well, I just make notes because I was preparing like five <laughs> minutes ago. And uh, <laughs> so the uh, author is from Unumclaw, Washington. Ring any bells? Ring any bells? Okay. All right. No. No. See the wheels turning. No, wait. 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 <laughs> uh, his first graphic novel was called Race Car. Anybody? Oh, yes. Okay. Now I'm going to yes. get into the actual graphic novel itself. Now, when I came to this graphic novel, it was around 2009, so it'd already been out about yes. five or six years. Uh -huh. um, it is part horror, part comedy, part slice of life. It's, you know, it's sort of weird shit happening in a small hick town, but the shit that's happening is random, but not. It's just so satisfying and well oh, Okay, yep. <laughs> you probably already know. Uh, it's, it's like reverential and referential, like he makes these, um, you can see his influences without them being heavy handed. Uh, it is, when I first encountered it, it was sort of unput downable. That's the only phrase that I could sort of, I came up with when, you know, when I first got this. And, uh, and I think a few other people have actually described it that way as well. Yes. Um, I, I have, and, okay, I have an, I have a guess. Okay. The anthology part's confusing me because I don't think it fits that, or I've just forgotten this part of it. Um, are we talking about runoff? 
we are yeah yes. okay I, I, to I've totally forgotten about whatever this anthology thing is <laughs> well it, well they when they it's so a odd god uh press is um is uh Jeff and oh I forgot the other guys name. ah Jesse thought, and Patrick oh yeah 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 that's um, right because they were the original ones to put it out god yeah. okay so I think I've long forgotten about this because my current the full because the the uh big collection of everything in one mm -hmm. graphic novel it's the not them picture. right no I don't know right there's... no right right you're right so I think actually... I had I think I had conveniently that forgotten makes sense actually it. okay yeah. Uh, yeah um but uh yeah like that that graphic novel for for anyone out there listening if you want to pick something up that you find a cozy corner dim the lights with the exception of one reading light pour a glass of wine sit down and dig into 450 pages of just batshit yeah. awesomeness run off by tom manning is the yeah. thing to pick up period yes it period. is it is i mean when you first read this graphic novel so this graphic novel was a revelation for me back in the day when i first read it it was you know the stuff I mean, i'll let you talk more at length about it but oh, just go, just go, a, go. A, a, yeah a couple a couple comments here on runoff it is when i first found it it was i want to say it was not a like it had the first two thirds were done um, and they and Odd God had released those like you know part one and part two kind of a thing. They released them in single issues, right? And I think I had the part one graphic novel and then, or issue number five or four or five or something like whatever was coming after at the time they were issues. And they were all they're kind of oversized like coffee table book, but in magazine floppy um, thing. And every issue, I mean, it's the way. Tom does Tom Manning, the artist and the writer, he does he does the lettering, all hand drawn, all hand done. So like the pages and the, you know, kind of like going back to like uh, the old Cerebus days where like Dave Sim did all the ooh, what is that <laughs> with the lighting yeah. that just happened on my screen there? Hold oh, on wow. a sec. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> is, it, is it going? No, what are you doing lighting? All right. So um a few notes on Tom Manning. <laughs> um, he so he it's back in the Cerebus days where you know you you have Dave Sim and like where the lettering and the art and the layout like it's all it it it's all one person's vision of how every page lays out and so the lettering has as much heft as the art so as like the the non lettered part of the art sometimes like it all just is I've never seen. I, or at the time I had uh, outside of Cerebus, I don't think I had ever seen a comic. Um, although to be fair, I think Chiroscuro, which you presented in an earlier episode, also does this a fair bit where the lettering is so key to the rhythm and flow of how you're supposed to, of how every panel is supposed to impact you, yeah, what the characters actually. are saying and how they're saying it. And Tom Manning, he manages to do it. What's even more impressing with him though, is I'd never seen anyone do horror with this lettering before and he does it in a way that's effective like you get like people it's it, it can it can actually be like you feel the thrills you feel that terror of what's happening and it actually gets a little freaky deaky like oh yeah it's a thriller it's a you know, proper thriller oh I mean, proper thriller horror i mean yeah. to the point where you're just like this is fucking spooky as shit and it's and he's doing it with like still art and not just like well, it's a spooky image but like the actual flow of what's happening in the same way a movie can get you on the edge of your seat like this graphic novel does it right. when you're um, sort of like he crafted the sound and the textures right. and everything in order to sort of right. reiterate the points and and it's 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 like watching a, a great thriller horror film i mean that's why i call it and most people many people refer to it as unput downable because once you pick it up and those fastballs and curves curveballs start to come at you you just want right. to keep going right. um I, I i i adore it uh it's it's dark and stylish you know those words are cliche as hell but and it yes. just is you've got werewolves guy again guys if you're looking for something to dig into that it's going to take you a little while depending on how you read uh 
you, you want some werewolves, some vampires, some mummies, uh, government agencies. Yeah, a small and all centered around a small town uh, near Mount Rainier. Um, and uh, it's it's Manning's runoff. And if Tom Manning, if you are uh, watching this and I doubt it, uh, <laughs> but if you do, hello. Over my, time, you never know. He might you. Google his name now and again and actually spot it. <laughs> thank you for this fucking book, man. It just, uh, I also think it is unbelievably underappreciated. Unbelievable. As oh, a matter okay. of fact, didn't we? Wait. Yes, we did. Yeah, we did. <laughs> Yes, we did. Was <laughs> yeah. So um, for those of you, our history, me and Dallas together, we had a comic book agency yeah. uh, that we represented uh, our creators um, for for quite a few years. And Tom Manning was one that we reached out to and tried like the Dickens to get something happening with this book that with was Eric, not self published right? or super with Eric. Yeah, because Eric. he already. Although Runoff was also in in you know something where it was like look. Yeah, uh, I'd approached Dark Horse with yeah. with uh, runoff at one point, so it was we. Yeah, uh, we I thought the meetings with them. Yeah, right. Yeah. At the time, he already had interest from uh, Guillermo del Toro yeah. uh, in the movie in the film rights. I believe they had it for for yeah. uh, his company and and his producer Lloyd Levin. If I'm mm -hmm. still remembering all this correctly, had interest there. Um, there was interest in Eric, but people, of course, wanted to see where it was going. And at the I time, know. we only had, I think, the first 80 pages. Although, I'm going to pause everything. Um, yeah. Do you have the book physically on your person right now or not? I have uh, volume one, or chapter one. Volume one. Hold on one second. I'm going to be right back. You have the omnibus. Do you have the omnibus? Ooh, there's a lot here. So, this is the full-sized omnibus. Ah, uh, you do have it. Of runoff. All right. So you can see here, and this is um, Tom's own one, or no, no, no. Oh, that's right. This is one piece. Okay. So one piece was actually I, the place that uh, did this all as a single thing. Right. So this is, um, and I believe one piece is the same publisher that did the Thieves and Kings uh, single volume that they put out as well. Or was that one piece or was that someone else? Oh, I can't remember now. That may have been one piece. piece. Yeah. I, I think it is one piece. Um, this was this was quite a few years ago, Sky. We're, we are old, we are old. Um, but see if you can, see if that is one piece. Oh, I've got that it the other, on the other shelves. In the you other got shelf. it in the other thing. You know, you know what, I'm gonna go look, hold on. <laughs> It is. So is it? The, the, oh, the New Thieves and Kings is one piece book okay, as well. Yeah. So this was, and this was a okay. new, this was uh, for the self-published versions that, that um, Thieves and Kings were the, was the uh, book that Dallas did in the previous episode. And this is volumes one and two in one volume. Um, so one and two, and uh, at the time, I believe, and I, this might still be true, volume two was out of print. Okay. on the iBox publishing on Mark's website, on the creator's website. So One Piece was a very cool, very, the editor there was really into these books the same way we were. Unfortunately, hmm. I don't think any of them did great on sales. No. Um, and so that was kind of the end of it. After that, they only did one volume of Thieves and Kings and they moved on. This at least is done in one. This is the big, thick, everything book. The Omnibus. The Omnibus. And you can see with some of this art in here, yeah. like it is, it's very, it's wonderfully hand-drawn, wonderfully kind of unrefined in its way. Here's like a big, very bloody moment right here where something's happening. Um, and you can see like with the, uh, let's see if I can do this without the light blazing it out it kind of doesn't well we'll put some art here up on the yeah. screen the way we normally do so you can see how that lettering works with each page and this was something and i also wanted to show you guys um since then tom has this is eric fully complete this is the whole story um and he kickstarted this and Dude, this is also this is as genius as runoff. In fact, it might be slightly more so. This is the best way to describe Eric 
um, is The Big Lebowski meets Twin Peaks. And it is phenomenal. Twin Peaks, there's a lot of Twin Peaks. There's a lot of Twin Peaks feel. in its work. Because <laughs> in Runoff, the same way, Runoff is Twin like Peaks. a Del Toro movie yeah. meets Twin Peaks. Um, the good thing about it, though, is unlike like Twin, I love Twin Peaks, so don't get me wrong, this is not throwing shade on it. It, it, it is a very David Lynchian type of a, um, a story, uh, sure. type of a, sure. a, 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 yeah, a, a, a thing, whatever you want to, because even story isn't quite what it is. Um, but whatever you'd like to call Twin Peaks in experience, um, it is very Lynchian. It's very, uh, it's his voice. It's him and Mark Frost. They do an amazing job. It's almost narratively cohesive, almost, but it does a lot more. And the, the narrative cohesion is not the point. Tom, on the other hand, like his stories are very narratively cohesive. Like they are coherent. They come together in the end. It's weird. It's out there. It's wacky. It's wild. It's unlike other things you've read before. And yet it works yeah. so beautifully well. And he, this is his third completely finished work. Oh, yeah called Bearing Straight, oh, yeah. which he also kickstarted not too long ago. And so these are the three big, great works oh. that Tom has done. We will, I will definitely link to his website where you can buy, I believe almost oh, all yeah. of these nowadays. He has like single omnibuses. I think even Runoff, he has his own yeah. copies of that that you can order. Um, he is a treasure. A treasure I man. adore him. a treasure. I, yes. I remember when I got that first chapter or the first one, 80 pages, I guess, of uh, Eric. It was mm -hmm. just like, yeah, wow. blew blew my mind. I mean, I wish I could have gotten other people interested in that Same. without him having to complete the dumb thing, um, because that was the problem. They're like, yeah, but where's the story going? And I'm like, I, yeah, every meeting he's with, right, with, right, every meeting. Let, let us know when it's done, and it's like, eh, all right, all come right. on, guys, you yeah, come on, guys, just see how that. look how well he's done with these eighty pages. That should be enough to, to have some, and then look at runoff as a completed work. You can see what he can do. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, Absolutely. such as, such as, such as the way in La La Land. Yeah. You know, it was so a, many times. It was a great time. It was a great time. <laughs> yeah. Um, very much. So um, now the yeah. wine. All right. So. Speaking of, I'm going to take a sip. Yeah. It's 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 sip time. Sip time. Maybe and now time. sip time. It's sip time. <laughs> now. And play a little like masterpiece theater music in the bed. Do, 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 do. Exactly. I'm back at the top. Um okay, so la, da, 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 where are we? And I've got my my stopwatch because we're gonna time on ourselves 60 seconds to guess, just like last time. Oh sweet! All right. Well, give me give me sixty seconds to find my notes. Uh, <laughs> Go. <laughs> <laughs> so first, I'll give you the blend. Mm -hmm. that, well, it is a blend. <laughs> it's a blend. It's a blend. It is a blend. Hint number uh, one. The uh, ratio proportions are eighty-five, ten, and five. Okay. Okay. Uh, the so. By California law, technically not a blend. A great hint number one. It's not California. <laughs> <laughs> hint number one. Uh, it is not a California blend. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and by the way, guys, uh, for those of you who don't know, California state law is it only has to be 75% of a grape and then they just get to call it that great. They do not have to tell you what's in the other 25%. Well, if it is California. 70, yeah, welcome to California. If it is 75% Cabernet Sauvignon, they just get to say it's a Cabernet Sauvignon and they don't have to. Now, a good winery, a winery that truly stands behind what it's doing will, whether they break it down on the bottle or whether you Google it and go to the website and see a text, what's called the text sheet for it, which will give you information of like, how long was it aged? What vineyards did it come from? Blah, blah, blah. Um, that will usually be readily available um, information for most consumers if they want to, to look it up. Um, but they don't have to. They, and plenty of places do not. They will just say, hey, it's a this, and it could be 100% that, or it could be as low as 75%, with 25% of who knows what. And they don't got to tell you. So, anyway, it's very true. Fun fact. Uh, Fun so, fact. Uh, hit number two, I guess, hint. Uh, Backstory number two. 
Um, the region is very rocky, extraordinarily rocky terrain. Uh, and I chose this wine particularly because of the limestone, which is mm. one of the dominant features uh, or consistent features of this region. And in uh, Eric's, in runoff, in Tom's runoff, the uh, proximity to the limestone around Mount Rainier um, is uh, a parallel, I draw. Uh, it was, is it a Washington wine? Oh, no. Oh, no. It is, it is technically an old world. Okay. Why? Technical. Okay. That's why I said it's a parallel, not a. Uh, okay. Now, yeah. is it when you say technically an old world? Is it only technically? Old, I mean, is it just because it's a it's a new winery, new winemaker kind of a thing, but in the old world, or is this a this that type of style, but still not in the old world? Classic winemakers, classic winemakers from the old world. They didn't make it in the old world, though. Mm. Made in the old world. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I technically an old world. That's weird. I, okay. It's, so, it's, you'll, you'll so it's an old world wine. Um, yeah. Okay. 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 Um, so, in terms of any ideas, any thoughts, any ideas? Um. All right. Well, well, it is that is. Oh, here, do this though. Uh, you got to give me a flavor profile. Oh yeah. So, um, as a matter, hold on. In real time. I, <laughs> in real time. <laughs> I'm going to work on mine while you're doing yours. Deep, That's good. Obviously, there's a very deep ruby color with garnet reflections. You can, can you see that? Can you see that? Oh, look, I can see the garnet rim. Ah. Oh, oh, careful, careful. The Spoiler garnet rim, report. for sure. Oh. Um, even though the rest of it obviously always comes as opaque. You'll enjoy, though. This is the real color of this wine today, let me tell you, buddy. This yeah. is obviously it looks as black as it always does in the middle of the That's light, but dense. Th wow. This That's is beyond. Fair. Yeah, yeah. This is like crazy dense. Okay, there's back some, to mine. We'll get to yours later. Quiet down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited for mine, but go. So, um, uh, underscored with leather. There's a heavy leather underneath. Uh, very heavy, heavy leather. Uh, has a very firm backbone. And when I say that, I say it because it is, it's very accessible. It is not an event wine. And that may give you some um, more information. Um, yes, okay. It okay. is like the acidity, it the acidity is sort of, uh, I hate to use the word balanced, but it just, it's so sort of, integrated it's just well integrated it's uh okay it's well rounded right. uh the finish is extremely gentle um which makes it really drinkable and unput downable <laughs> uh -huh. you're welcome uh black cherry and licorice in there as well right right okay okay I mean, that's interesting because those are all as accessible as it is. Those are all flavors like the leather, the licorice, like that seems like something denser and darker and, and not as accessible per se. Um, whew. Okay. So, so maybe the region, try the region first. Try, try the region first. All right. Are, is it a French wine? No. Italian? Yes. Okay, perfect. I only had three that I thought limestone was going to be a big part of, which was uh, Germany as well. So France, Italy, and maybe Germany. I'm not familiar enough with Germany to know for sure, but I figured that they probably had some limestone um, elements oh, in there. Yeah. And yeah, mm -hmm. the French are usually more clay, but they have some. I think I think Mosul um, is uh, limestone. Oh, I don't know. I, I've, I, I swear I've looked some this up before, but this is the problem with, with wine knowledge. There's so much of it, unless you do this for There's a living. So much of it's, it. Yeah, so much of it is like in, in one side of your brain and out the other. And Absolutely. you're just like, I just keep absorbing wine knowledge, but does it stick? Only after this episode, I'm going to remember limestone. And in, in our 80s, um, we're going to be really good at this. Right. Okay, my first guess, because it's Italy, 
Um, you know what? I'm going to guess Brunello de Montalcino. Okay. Okay. I you that's because of the the flavor profile, the uh... the flavor profile and the color of it. I it, that Brunello de Montalcino tends not to be quite as accessible. I'm um, the ones I've drunk. I've loved them, um, but because they're like that heavier Sangiovese Grosso yeah. um, version of the Sangiovese. And I know Chianti is going to be your truly accessible um, wine. So that's going to be my guess number two. Yeah. But All my right. guess number one is Brunello. I'm, I'm going to go. I feel like Chianti is the true answer, but I'm going to go with Brunello for my first one. It for all intent and purpose. <laughs> uh, most people often will uh, think of this wine as a Chianti. Okay. Uh, it is a Sangiovese uh, Merlot and Cab Sauv, 8510 5. Uh, it okay. is a Mont Antico, uh, Toscana. Get it more uh, center of the screen. Yeah. Ah, there it. we are. Can you see that? There we go. You know, no. it's very blind. Yeah, the light's very oh, blinding on that one. Okay. Um, oh, maybe you can oh. send you can send me a maybe you send me a picture. Oh, there, there it goes. Is. Yay, Monte Antico, Toscana. Yeah, Toscana blend. Okay, it's um, it's kind of so if if I'm in the mood to read something or I need to edit something and I need to sit for hours on end and I need some lubrication that is just exceptionally pleasant that I don't have to think too much about that is just so satisfying. I'm grabbing this bottle of wine and- Interesting. The price point is just crazy too. It's, it's great, it's fantastic. It's a $11 bottle of wine. Ooh, and yet you like it that much. I fucking adore it. <laughs> where'd you where'd you find where'd you find where'd you purchase that one? Uh this one I got from actually I don't remember where I got. I've got four or five here already. Um waiting. Uh <laughs> especially when I'm in like editing mode and I'm working on the script or something. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. uh this one is the one I reach for when I don't wanna, you know, put too much effort into it and I know mm -hmm. I want. It's gonna be satisfying. I'm gonna keep picking that glass up and chugging it down and enjoying every mouth full. It just is fantastic to me. So um, Montantico, Amazing. bravo guys. And uh, yeah, I, wow. you know, when I was thinking about runoff, it, it, this is, is what um, popped up. It definitely has that mineral uh, limestone um, tingle, uh, which right. is fantastic. Uh, and you know, I need to get deeper into Toscana, into all those Tuscany wines, because Chianti is something I'm, I'm fairly well familiar with at this point. The Brunellos, mm -hmm. obviously, we got familiar with Barolo recently as well. Um, yeah. But Tuscany is one, and, and that's one that, like the Chianti. Uh, by the way, guys, like, check out that Barolo yeah. episode. Uh, if you know when you watch this, uh, Dave and I both made the same <laughs> response. Had the same response to the uh, high end. Spoiler. It's, oh yeah, sorry guys. Oops. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I mean, correction. Sorry, guy out there watching this. <laughs> sorry, Dad. <laughs> I've, I've done Toscana blends mm. here in California, so the Toscana style, um, okay. with the, with the same with whatever the and I don't even know the. Uh, I've looked so little into into Tuscany that I don't even know what the regulations there are. Like, what may what are they allowed to put in, into a Toscana and what are they not? Um, yeah, that's a question. I need. We need to look into that. We will. Yeah. We'll do an episode on that one day. And actually, we did Barolo for you. We'll do. We'll do Toscana soon. We have that's another wine coming up very soon um, for a big blind tasting that we'll that we'll deep dive into. But it won't be Toscana. It's something else. You got to tune in to find out. But um, amazing. So runoff and runoff and the Mont Antico Toscana. Um, Mont Antico. This just seriously. Uh, this is. It's, it's, yeah. Delish. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy the All right. All right. All right. So <clears throat> for me, we're going to go a bit more obscure than Toscana. Let me tell you. This is um, more of that uh, maple wine. No, I'm joking. no, it's nowhere near <laughs> as obscure as maple wine, which, um, yeah, my God. I, which I was still, actually I, I, surprisingly, surprisingly delicious. 
surprisingly good. That's why I bought the bottle and dog took it home. Like we, I, I had it at the tasting at that maple winery. Oh. And I was like, okay, what the hell is this one? This is, and I didn't realize at the time they just called the early spring reserve. So I'm like, okay, it's oh. their dry white wine blend. Um, yeah. But it's a good white wine blend. I'll take it home. And it was only later that I realized that it was made with 100% maple syrup, no grapes. And that <laughs> blew my mind. I was like, wait, it tastes like white freaking wine, except for that hint of maple in the background. Which where gave you're just it like, that um, cordial feel on the yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, you kept cordial. expecting it. Your brain kept thinking it was sweet. And yeah. you're like, because it tastes like maple syrup. Like, it can't Absolutely. not be sweet, but it's not. All right. So for me, my comic today is a, a relatively recent image comic miniseries oh, I'm um, that, <laughs> no um but this one was uh there was something about it and i don't know what it was i i pre-ordered it um online from my local comic shop it was one of those rare moments where i actually bought a physical comic through the traditional <laughs> channels I've, I've i started again about um mid-pandemic actually supporting one of the local comic shops here. I had been getting stuff from Kickstarter and um, on digital, online, Amazon, what have you. I'd stopped going to comic shops yeah, um, for, for a long, long time. Um, and crowdfunding was my way of finding uh, new work and new artists and things like that. Um, but recently during the pandemic, I was like, you know what? There were a couple artists that had books coming out and they were like, please pre-order, it's important to us. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll actually. And some of these were overseas, like writers and artists, but they were making an American comic book because that you could do that these days. Um, so I was like, I'm gonna support their work. I'm gonna support the local comic shop. So, and so there are like a handful of titles that I'm getting per month now through the local comic shop. And this was one that recently finished. It's four issues, four double-sized 48 page issues that create the entire series. And it was, so it is called dumb, Step by Bloody Step. Step by and, Bloody Step. Step by Bloody. And it is, this is also one of my favorite logos right now. I love this. You've got one footprint and then the bloody footprint mm. in the B and the D. And there's something about the way this is kind of stacked and the L connecting that. And it's just, mm. it's so beautiful, like step by bloody step. It's like got this progression because mm -hmm. the whole book is about this, this little baby girl, right? And yeah. she's in the hand of this gi armored giant. And you can see this arm, and it even opens the very first page is just the baby. Ooh, in the right. palm all right and then when you when it opens up on the next few pages you can kind of get an image of this giant very almost night-like mm -hmm. k-n-i-g-h-t night-like mm -hmm. protector right now it is a entirely wordless series there is no text whatsoever Ooh. it is four 48 page issues of this then the art must very... be spectacular the the narrative they must be spectacular and this is so this is by uh Cy Spurrier is the writer and he's done a lot of he's a British writer he's done a lot of 2008 AD work okay okay yeah. um he's done and he did do other I thought I was really I was like oh I love Cy Spurrier it's one of the reasons I bought the comic turns out no <laughs> I've never read a single thing he's done <laughs> <laughs> Wait, who to my, no, to my knowledge, I looked up his bibliography and I was like, no, I know this. I know I love Cy Spurrier. And especially I thought of him, I thought I had read a graphic novel that he had done with another British artist called Fraser Irving. And they had done quite a few numbers of work through 2000 AD that have, I'm sure has since been collected. But I looked at the titles of all of them and I'm like, none of the these are written okay. well. Yeah, okay. All right. Wow. But him and Fraser Irving, I swear I have read something by them. But I looked through his bibliography. I'm like, nope, I've just seen his name around. That is apparently what I know him from. Um, and then he did this with a, a artist called Matthias Bergara. Uh, okay. And Matthias Bergara, look at this gorgeous visual spread mm. right here. And you can see the reflection in this pool down yeah. below of everything that's happening up here. Um, there are so many gorgeous spreads of art. You have things that he does. Uh, here, here's another just beautiful, beautiful spread. Mm. I can get. That's I mean, just magnificent. This is a fantasy world. That this all takes place in of some kind. Um, and it's these two, this, this little child and this giant armored knight. 
And they are step by bloody step, just trekking through this world. You don't know why. You have no idea what the point of it is, okay. but they can't stop. And they just have to keep going. When they either issues? stop for how many? Four. Four. Okay. Just four. And it's done. That is the whole story. Uh, the trade paperback. The entire thing is wordless? Soon. Yes. The entire thing is wordless. So it is, um, there are moments when they, let me see if I can find some of these gorgeous, these moments. Um, and there are some really cool, oh, this is, this is a really cool, I'll, I'll probably throw this art up on screen in another way, but I want to see if I can, I can get Dallas to Ooh, see that's this here. Quite, oh, that's beautiful. Wow. That's why, but you can see like the girl child sees this flower and then on the next panel, she's reaching for the, the flower in the, like, there's great things the art does like this, it just sort of puts the whole page together and just keeps it going. Very but cinematic. Then if, it's very, very cinematic. cinematic, very, very yeah. cinematic. And if they stay in one place too long or try to go backwards, there's like this almost elemental wind that whips up that tries to buffer, like, I mean, just terrorizes them until they keep moving. And then they have to keep going. And again, you don't know why. Uh, this world is full of monsters. It is also full. And this was this was also one of my all time favorite little spreads. This is issue two, mm -hmm. and you can see these ships that are going on here yeah. and just terrorizing ground. And there are people in these ships. It's kind of like the Empire in Star Wars kind of mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. where it's just there are these. There is obviously this elite human element of society that is in control of most things, and then you have your you have a peasant kind of serfdom. Okay. Uh, element of society that is being terrorized by them and also this sort of other ale like green ogre like species mm. that is very much um used as slaves and uh sort of fodder um by the elite and these two oh oh and the other really so and the girl child as well when she in this world there is there are scenes of beautiful um See if I can find a good thing. There, there are scenes of like, there's, there's, what there, there's parts of the world that are like filled with like gorgeous water, like okay. lakes or or lakes or oceans. There are some elements of forestation, uh, but for the most part, there's there's a lot of this world that seems very kind of barren and dead um, okay. to it. And the girl, when she bleeds, when her blood hits anything, things grow. Oh. and brings sort of life back to this planet that is obviously being scoured and and uh burned to the burned down to the nub um so is it is it uh i have questions uh, and this is the only kind of text there is there is you probably can't see this very well here but it's not it's language people are talking but mm -hmm. it's just symbols it's like made up symbols. So you don't know what's it's like people are saying things and talking to each other, but it's it's the reader gets nothing out of that. Oh, that's that's how I write. <laughs> Hell of a reader. <laughs> so this graphic novel, there was something about it that um the the title, the look of it, I didn't realize that it was gonna be completely wordless when I when I bought into it. Um, I was just like, this looks really fascinating. It was going to be a four issue series. I knew that going in. I thought only the first issue was 48 pages, like a big giant size first issue. It turns out they're all 48 pages and it's all wordless and it's all beautiful. And the story, the story, is, the story is amazing. It's very well crafted. There are things. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to share my screen here with an interview with, um, with the writer that he did. And he does mention here. Uh, when they ask him about putting this together and he says um if you have these characters so normally in, in these kinds of stories if you have these characters who are compelled to walk in a straight line but even they don't know why 
their mm -hmm. inability to ask perpetuates that mystery. So it's quite nice to have that because one of the things that drives me mad in fiction is characters in a mysterious situation who don't ask the right question. Often you are trying to tell a mystery story and the whole thing falls apart if a character actually says, excuse me, what the fuck is going on? Um, by making that impossible by the, for these characters, we've removed that whole crisis from the story. And it's because the girl can't speak and the knight character doesn't speak. So it is, they are literally <laughs> voiceless characters. So in this. I'm, I'm laughing because I just got a note on one of my scripts <laughs> and the note was, it seems like you don't give a fuck about the audience because you don't give us any answers. Yes. And I was like, yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> you don't, you don't. And look, you got to walk a fine line on some of that. Like I do, I totally agree that you shouldn't dumb things down too much. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, um, you should respect the intelligence of your audience, but at the same time, if you go too far the other direction, this is my own personal opinion, but if you go too far in the other direction, it is, you know, it's it's like being um, a contrarian, you know, uh, to some degree yeah. where, where you're just like, I'm just yeah. not doing it because uh, because people normally do it. And so I'm just not going to do, but I'm not going to do it so <laughs> thoroughly that it's like, well, then why are you doing it at all? Yeah, no, I get that. Um, my, mine is definitely yeah. organic to the world, the world building, right. and, you know, the narrative. Right. And, but but I do think if you can- amazing because- He's so, I mean, he's using it as a theme, not, it just, yes. that's fantastic. And uh, to go on a little bit, the, this last, the second paragraph I highlighted here, um, Spurrier and Bergara aren't the only creative forces behind Step by Bloody Step. Oh, wait, no. Um, I want to go down to the second, this paragraph here. Um, he understands in the end, the idea is to create the beautiful story in the right way. Or maybe, oh yeah, and this is one of the monsters that pops up in issue one. That just, and this world is populated with these giant beasts, which style. the night character, the style right? Is with very, which, which, yeah, and the night like character, early has 80s even sort of um, a little bit, a little bit, almost, um, a little bit. It's got almost like this, this very trying to think. There are other artists I know of, comic artists that have this sort of very fluid, well detailed, but also yeah. this very fluid, very um, sinuous style yeah. to their to their line work, which which I love quite a bit, almost and a little smudgy. You know, a little like there's it's got this element of all this stuff, like the 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 earth and the sand and the wind and the water, all of it kind of mushing, blending together in the art. So you've really got to take a moment and look at the you get what's happening with one glance at the panel. But if you really look, you can see all sorts of stuff happening. Because but it, really doesn't have to take a seem, it doesn't even seem digitally done. I mean, maybe that's the goal. It seems very. Wow, that's just. Yes. Oh. Um, I like that. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe that was the main thing that I wanted to. Here's one of the vistas with all. Again, you can see there's so much going on in this world. And one of my favorite things um, about this, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here so I can come back to showing you some pages. Um, is so much of the action actually takes place in the background mm. while they're just sort of going through other things. So one of the things I love is so the little girl. And this is one thing I'm not 100% clear. She starts to grow up, you know, as the series progresses. And she's like, la, 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 frolicking, frolicking. And you can see in the very background, the knight's fighting something while she's just frolicking. <laughs> and then it, you close in on the knight and he's killed something. And she's having a gay old time while he's in the background constantly killing things. So is that a consistent... Protecting is that her. A, is that a consistent theme where her, like, innocence is sort of a bubble in the chaos? A little bit, a little bit. She know the the sometimes the night it, like her death comes so fucking close that the night is right there and killing the thing right in front of her, and then you know and then like kind of the night doesn't really get upset upset per se, but it's like obviously it's like you're making my job hard. So um, is she aware of the doom impending doom? Some of it, but okay. I do think that when she gets into her childlike bubble. And it is for once, like, and I think that's the thing is like her life is all about this journey mm -hmm. and is just constant journey, journey. So when she has these moments and she's a kid, you know, it's like she has to go into that bubble, but she doesn't understand that the killing and the danger never stops. I think she thinks it happens some of the time and doesn't realize how ever present and, and always Aww. that it is. Um, one of my favorite things about this book as well uh, so there's a bit of a, a, a kind of a narrative twist at the very end of issue one. 
um, that's a reveal. I'm not going to reveal it here, but it. it's a it's I'm a reveal. It. I, I was surprised to see that they revealed it that quickly. Um, and the moment it's revealed, I knew exactly how the series was going to end. Oh, okay. and it is. How right, the we're we're going to we're going to come back to this and discuss this after I read it. I, I, I'm, OK, I, OK. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I knew how it was going to end. And it is exactly how it ends. But that doesn't ruin anything. OK, there is still one. There's a there's enough going on. And in that interview, I think the other thing that he that I that I didn't find when I just shared my screen that I was looking for was he mentions how like we because it's all visual, mm. he really wanted readers to be able to come uh, to have somewhat of their own interpretation of everything that's going on. Like this fantasy world that's going on here, there's no you know they don't give you tons of like here are the species and their backgrounds. Here's yeah. a map of the world. Here's a bit. It's like no. It's like you're going to see all this stuff. All of it is is classic enough. The kinds of things you're seeing that you're going to be able to kind of get the gist of what's going on in this world without actually understanding the politics or the history or where these things come from or what all these different environments are. Uh oh, not that camera <laughs> or what these different environments are. You're just going to have to put some of these pieces together and there are elements of even though I knew how the series was going to end and it does end that way, it is still a little up in the air as to why it, it ends that way. Why is that the thing that is going on here? Hmm. And there are interpretations that like the story gives you enough to come up with multiple versions of why, but it doesn't give you a definitive version of oh, why. I, I'm, I'm, I'm titillated by this because it's so rare you encounter, and I will, it's sort of, this is one of those sort of ego moments where I'm like, okay, that <laughs> sounds like the kind of thing I do occasionally in some of my work, Right, is I like to pull the reader along on a journey without giving them, um, you know, a key or a legend right. and right. you know right. it's it's about the journey it's about getting wherever the fuck you end up <laughs> it right. will be satisfying in its own way um but the journey depends on what you bring to it and i i like that i like that i'm i'm putting that on the list for sure you absolutely should if, if you haven't gotten it by the next time we're in the same room together i will pass it on to you um because now i've read it and it's I mean, it's eminently, especially as a, as a wordless thing, it's eminently rereadable slash ogle, ogleable, yeah. um, because you just you can just keep looking at this stuff. The art is absolutely masterful. I mean, you know, this cover alone is just yeah. God, I love that cover right there. Yeah. Um, this is this is kind of the final cover right, of the final issue with the girl holding the, so the only hand four the issues. Art. There's no only four issues. scan nope. for nope. it's nope. Nope. I mean, maybe really they come back to it. Property. They could no nothing. So I mean, could they ever revisit this? Of course they could. But are it does is this, does there seem like there's any reason or plan to no none whatsoever. So this is done in one, as far as we know, um, or and I think as far as the creators currently are aware. Um, I will say Spurrier and Bergara they apparently worked together on a ten issue series from Boom before doing this. I was unaware of that. I, I was unaware of what I'm, I'm, I'm off the top of my head. I'm not going to remember what Didn't the they do a was. Star Wars thing or he did a Star Wars thing, right? He might have done. A, he's done. A, he's done a few, especially going coming out of 2000 AD. You know, do a lot of licensed properties okay. like Judge Dredd and things like that. Right. Um, and I think he's done a few. But uh, this is an original property by him and Bergara. I believe the Boom one was an original property, an original idea they did. And then this is their second thing they've done together. That one is not wordless. That one is a, is a, for lack of a better way to say it, normal comic, regular, exactly what you expect kind of comic. But this one was their, their I'm fascinated. I would love to see so much more about the creative process of this because there's so Wait, much about the art and the way the Simon, narrative Simon Simon Spurrier. Sai, Sai, not Simon. Uh, I don't Cy, believe. Did Simon Spurrier do Hellblazer? Uh, Constantine? Uh, oh, so, yes. So, yes. So, I haven't read his run on, on Hellblazer. Um, he did one very recently in 2019. Um, That's why. So, it is him. It, it is him. If, if you know him, so I have not read. See, again, I think I've just seen his name on so many things because yeah, I, I feel like, read oh, it, I know Sai Spurrier. 
but I haven't read anything he's actually read done it. until this. Um, I just knew of it. Um, as, as we noticed in the last uh, episode we did where I paired a Hellblazer, an old yeah. Hellblazer work, I've been going through those omnibuses. Okay. I'm at Andy Diggle's run on it right now, which is about around issue 240 or so of 300 of the original Vertigo run. Okay. And when I'm done with that, I finally get to the newish, the newer runs that they've been doing recently. And then Spurrier did a, like the latest one. So it's going to be a while till I get to him. That's but why I will I, be when, reading when him you eventually. mentioned the name, I was like, I know this name. I know this name. I know yeah. this name. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, awesome. Ah. All right. So the wine to go with this one yeah. is, you know, this was a very, I, I decided this one, you know, even I read the first issue and while I was reading the first two show, I'm like, this needs a serious, quote unquote, serious wine. All like right. there's so much happening here. It's intense. It's a lot. It's all, there's very little downtime. There's very little breathing room. Okay. Yeah, even when, even when the characters have a little bit of downtime, the art is so magnificent and there's so much taken on every panel. You as the reader, there's no downtime. You are constantly just moving, tr translating, like taking it in and digesting what is ha what is going on and figuring figuring out every piece because again it doesn't it doesn't spoon feed you you're figuring so does everything that out. mean your wine is perplexing no so the way that term the way i've seen that term thrown around it's kind of a shitty term to use for wine because all wine if it's good if it's complex and it's got a lot going on in the glass should be serious right, <laughs> right. um but in this case they tend to use it for like your heavy dense um like you know Napa cabs and and Syrahs and petite Syrahs and petite Bordeaux, those things that are dense, chewy, tannic, um, punchy in the face, punchy in the mouth kind of a things. Mm -hmm. um, Barolos could could work very well with the serious kind of wine when when we had those. Um, so I went, and at first I thought it was going to be um, a something a slightly more traditional or slightly more less off the beaten path in terms of varietal, um, but in the end. I went for, and your clue here is that this is uh, your first clues anyway, is that this is, and you can see it is, it's got, it's got some dark color. Now, when I swirl it, it's got, you know, it's got, it's purple. It's very reddish, purplish, more purplish than red. Okay. But very uh, blue purple, kind of a, no, no, maybe it is, maybe it is more like red it's purple, deep garnet. Pink it purple. Like it's a very deep garnet when I mean, when you really thin it out, you can start to see yeah. the lighter reddish purple of the whole thing. Wow. The bleed on yeah. that even it doesn't. Yeah. yeah, wow. It is and it is so and it is known to be very tannic. In fact, yeah. the amount of of uh, tannins in it is we think people think is where the name derives from. It is, um, it was originally uh, planted and grown in France. Okay. And this is a California version of this single varietal wine. And okay. the very first people to bring this varietal to California did it in Paso Robles. So it is in the US, for lack of a better way to say it, native, to, pa to Paso Robles, um, even though technically obviously not native to anywhere in the US, but, uh, and it is also very, very popular in Virginia, is the other place that it is predominantly grown in the US. Shit, I don't know much about Virginia wines, except it's the one. known as one of, it's not, there's one other Virginia wine that is known is like the state's wine because it was even, I believe, created in Virginia originally. This one was not created in Virginia, but it grows really well there. It creates amazing wines. So it's the second um, one, I believe it's just about the second most popular red wine in Virginia. Um, but in California, Paso is the place to do it. And I got this bottle from the vineyard that originally planted it in California. Wait, okay, so let's do a review. Yes. We've got very dark, tannic, high tannic, red wines, single variety. And the name Plus. derives from how tannic it is. Paso Robles. Paso. 
Paso Robles, you said, right? Yeah, I, w I will say the apparently the the most correct way to say it is Paso Robles. Right. Because we had a discussion last week. We had a discussion, discussion think, right? <laughs> that is what the natives call it. Um, so yeah. if you live there, you, it's Paso Robles. That is officially the correct way to say it, even though obviously it's derived from Spanish, and that is not how you would pronounce it in Spanish. What so the, the thing that immediately comes to mind is no, that's not. Don't forget so the name, seconds. the name, the, cl the clue you gave with the name, the, 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 I think there's a wine and I do think if there's mm -hmm. a, a, a Virginia, <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, there's a Tanit, Tanit? You got it, Tanit. Tanit, Tanit. Tanit. Ah. So yeah, T-A-N-N-A-T for those of you uh, listening in. And is that this right? is, yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is, let's see, let's see if I can get this thing to, uh, there we oh, go. Yes. Tablas Creek. Um, anyways, it was there for like a, a brief. It's T A N N A T. Tanat is is uh, the brand, uh, the the varietal. Um, we think it was named that because of how tannic it was. We have no paper trail to actually prove that, but that is that is the the guesstimation like that. these like, days. We'll, we'll but that. it like is Tanat is such a depending on where it's grown, it can it can be either very black fruit or red fruit. Um, this one is, is, I would say, ah, you know, I would almost, I would almost give this blue fruit a All little right. bit. It's a little the, the free associate. Give me the, the, uh, give me some of the, the notes here. Give me the notes. And this is a, for, for a Tanat, very young. Okay. This is a 2019. Okay. And Tanat is one of those like very age worthy varietals because of the high tannins and it's high acidity. So it is, it is very on the nose. You know what, it, it kind of smells, it kind of smells like you just opened a package of red licorice. Like it has a little bit of that, like you open some red vines or some Twizzlers and you get that whiff okay. from the package. Okay. There's some of that going on in here. And there's then you've like got- Like an acidic cherry kind of thing. Acidic cherry is good, cherry, yeah. I will definitely, I will definitely give this some cherry. On the palate, you get a little bit more of like a blueberry blackberry. Okay. It's a little bluer and blacker fruit. Not so much red fruit on the palate, but on the nose, it actually smells very red. Mm. So you get this very springtimey, you no, know, like strawberries and um, because it is like strawberry liquor licorice more more than cherry mm, licorice. That's true. Yeah. But I would say strawberry, cherries, raspberries, there it's all it's all in that muddle somewhere. Of, of how this is coming out. There is a sensation that is somewhere between citrus and mineral um, that is very light, very bright, very bright and lively and crisp um, okay. for a red, especially for a deep dark red like this. Um, it is, Tanat is one of those, this, this is a varietal that has surprised me multiple times. This is my third single varietal Tanat I've ever tried. And they've all come from Paso. I've never tried one from anywhere else yet. Um, the Blending Lab, one of my one of, one of my local wineries, did a Paso single varietal to not. Um, they don't have it currently, but they had a, a vintage of that in previous years. And it was, it, I, the first time I tried it, I wasn't sure if I liked it. It is one of those reds where it's, it's very, it's a unique enough beast mm -hmm. that you've got to, it's not what you expect when you first take it, but it is definitely that's what people say when they talk about us actually <laughs> i taste so many things that i almost contradict myself like doing the red and, and blue and black fruit and i'm like i don't know all of the above somewhere like <laughs> right. that you know in, in in that venn diagram it's like right. where they all meet you know somewhere in there and that's this um like mulberry is, uh, that's that's the description of that is mulberry is good yeah maybe mulberry then i i'm i'm not familiar i need to taste some mulberry jam or something like that yeah. to really know for sure but uh interesting uh blending lab usually has a uh used to used to huh? their mm -hmm. latest vintages they have not done to not okay. i don't know if they're going to come back to it one year um <laughs> or if they just kind of they're like oh that was a worthy experiment but we're good <laughs> and moved on um if to not was good but uh but these guys um, these are the OGs for California. 
Okay. They brought Tanat to the, the U.S. They and planted the, the first they, vine. What's the name again? Tablas Creek. T-A-B-L-A-S. Creek Vineyard. We will, of course, put all this information in the description of Definitely. this video yeah. or podcast, depending on how you're watching it, After down Grand below. Pop and this is their 2019 Tanat. Um, so Paso is one place where you can find a number of wineries these days. And apparently, because when they brought it over and then other wineries were interested in it, and so they were able to um, clone, like basically graft and give vines to other wineries to use as well. But they were the first, and right. they cre they started the whole Tanat thing in the U.S. Um, and I believe it's even where the Virginia wines got their first vines and whatnot. So yeah, we're gonna they're 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 the ones, and they do they obviously know what they're doing with Tanat because this is this is very smooth. The I mean, for it's not. Phenomenal. And the color is amazing. Um, it's very unique. If outside of the floral bits on the nose and those those blue to black fruit elements, I'm trying to figure out what these other flavors are. I'm I'm having a, you know, there's definitely some like cinnamon and baking spice in there mm. that's going on. That might be the thing that's really been throwing me off, mm. like nutmeg. Um, okay. Is there any clove? Even some at all? Uh, any clove. You know what? I'm like honestly, mace. Mace. Okay. Which is almost there's an element that's like baking spice, almost to the piney side of okay. baking spice, which yeah. is where mace comes in. Because like if you've ever put too yeah. much mace in something, it's inedible. <laughs> it, it, it's one of those flavors like pine, where it's like it it can really enhance and be delicious. And if you go just that little bit too far, it's you're, medicinal. You're, you're effed. Yeah. It, yeah. It's like you can't you can't drink it, you can't taste it, you can't smell it, can't do anything. And it's not, I mean, this is delicious. No, so this is, but it's got that like allspice where that mace is included in there to give it that little bit of almost like piney menthol element, both on the nose and yeah. on the palate. I'm and it's, but it's, about it's so good. The heritage of the actual grape. You said it's French, right? Originally French, yeah. And I think they still grow it, but not nearly as much as they used to, is my understanding. Beautiful. Yeah, and it oh, is used. Okay. It, it, I think it was it was released in France um, as its own wine. Cardamom is the spice you're tasting. Cardamom. Cardamom. Oh, cardamom. maybe, maybe. I love candy. cardamom. Yeah, I love cardamom ice cream. Um, I definitely would still go with mace, as unpalatable as that may sound to some people. But um, but cardamom too. I mean, again, all those winter spices or all spice spices, kind of a thing like that nutmeg, the cardamom, the the mace the the um cinnamon so here's um, a question. all of those they're in what, there what meal are you eating this with? what is this complimenting <laughs> meal am i eating this with <laughs> like i'm not like, just drinking this all, to, to, <laughs> all on its own and getting tipsy come on now um if i was going to eat this with something <laughs> i would eat it with one of two things i mean for me, I would need this in a heavy sauced chicken. I would not do red meat with this. There's something about it, and I think it's that acidity and that keeps it lively and bright, even as dense and chewy as it is. Like red meat, you need your cabs, you need your Syrahs, your petite Syrahs. Yeah. This one, though, that brightness still makes me want to want to want to stick to something that's a little more on the line. But if you do fish, you want to do something like blackened fish mm. like something that's got that cajun spice that and kick stand to it. up to the weight of that yeah. right um yeah. and same thing with the chicken i would do chicken with either a very heavy kind of like marsala type gravy mm. you know something that something that's got some heft to it or again going in that like jamaican jerk or or cajun or um uh raza hanu um mm. type spice blends mm. where you're really getting into that red heavy with the kick spices um, right. That is what I think this would go beautifully with. Good, sweet, sweet. All right, Good choices, man. That was. Uh, I'm definitely going to check out that uh, comic, and I'm going to have to get a bottle of the Tanat. Um, ah, sure, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I'm going to have to open another bottle of this because I just didn't do it. <laughs> I know, I know. It's so funny. I, before I came to Tanat, I was talking to Dallas about this right before we started filming the show. But I, I thought I was going to do a Syrah with this originally and then i was like no 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 no. okay but there's this really amazing really dark it's a tempranillo syrah petite syrah and malbec blend 
that because they're all heavy grapes they're all and i was like maybe that and i was really close on that and then i remembered this tonight and i'm like you know what it's because of that brightness to the tonight that i thought step by bloody step needed because you have there's a lightness as as intense as it is and as much as it's going on as, as much as you have to pay attention and study every panel to really figure out what's going on there is still because there's no text and you also have that that youth and um innocence of the main character mm -hmm. in her bubble that she gets into so there is there is this brightness and 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 liveliness to the, all the proceedings as well that all the other heavy mm. wines serious red wines were not quite matching as close as they were and then i remembered i had this tonight and i was like it's the only tonight i had so i was like oh i'm like do i open it and i'm like yeah fuck it let's open it so <laughs> i went ahead and did it well because that was something too i was like you're supposed to age it so i was like i'm gonna sit on this for years and in the end i'm like you know what well you're just gonna have to buy another one just get another bottle <laughs> just gonna have to do another one if i want to age something that much it's 2019 i'm sure they still have some but um all right, guys, that's Beautiful. another wine and comics parent show. Look up the wines, look up the comics. Very they sweet. are all exceptional. I got to look up Dallas's too, because something that affordable that is that quaffable um, sounds like something I need a couple bottles of it's, in my house it's, as uh, well. It's a, it's a four day a week kind of guy. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know. All right, it guys. Really all right, guys. Peace thanks out. So we much. will see you next time. <laughs> no sleep i mean i'm at the age now where i can i can not essentially not sleep one night and one night only even yeah. if it's you know and power nap a little like you know i fade out during the day and but you know wake back up and whatever but like the next night i will sleep like a absolute baby That's um great. it only takes once but it, that day sucks because my brain simply does not function i do okay yeah. but Every time I think like, well, you know what? I just didn't sleep tonight. It's okay. I'll just, I'll get so much done because I've just been up this whole time. But as you get like, literally that lack of sleep, return. like, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. you just can't figure shit out anymore. Yeah. And you're like, everything is such a struggle. Um, sitting is uncomfortable. Standing is uncomfortable. Everything just starts going wrong and wrong and wrong as you keep going. Oh, it's terrible. I, mean, um, I, can, I can fake it pretty well. You're about to see that though.